This is the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show, sponsored by your North Texas Chevy dealers. Together, let's drive. Welcome to the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. I'm Joe Trahan. We're live here in Boston. In fact, we're on Boston Harbor. We're just steps away from TD Garden, where it'll be the Mavs of the Celtics in Game 5 of the NBA Finals tomorrow. The Mavericks have certainly made this Finals much more interesting than it had been in the first three games after their blowout win in Game 4. So now we get to see if they can double down and get things done in hostile territory. All right, right now, let's bring in my partner in crime, AC, AC. Seely, my main man, the producer himself, he likes to cut and scratch on the ones and twos when he edits. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop riffing now. It's Andrew Seely, our producer. What's going on on the show tonight, Andrew? I, I, I'm a little confused with where you were going. One thing or another, Joe, the one thing that comes out of this whole playoff run, the playoff beard lasted the entire way. All right, let's get right into it with what's on the show. <laughs> Here's What's on the Show, sponsored by NFM. All right, with the NBA and Stanley Cup Finals over, we can finally turn our attention to Indianapolis for the U.S. Olympic swimming trial. Oh, oh wait, excuse me, hang on, I'm getting... Apparently the Mavs did force a Game 5. Obviously we've got to break down what went right in Game 4 and how the Mavs <laughs> can pull off the greatest series comeback in NBA history. Plus, it's Father's Day, and we got a top five father moments in sports coming up later in the show. It's a little ambiguous for a reason. Joe, that is what's on the show. Now, who is on the show? Yeah, we got our resident hoop head. We got to have Jonah Javad if we're talking NBA Finals because <laughs> my main man knows hoops big time, as does Nick Angstead from the Locked on Mavs podcast. He digs in. He's been at every game, and he talks about it. He talks about every game for like seven hours after the game, so we had to have him on, too. It's a great panel, and we want to jump right into what's going on with the Dallas Mavericks right now because I'm curious. I want to throw this out, and I'm not going to give my opinion. I'm going to throw it out to you first, Nick. Was what we saw in game four more about the Dallas Mavericks or about the Boston Celtics? Ooh, I'm glad we're not playing no fence riding right now because I'm going <laughs> to ride the fence a little bit here because I think the opening <laughs> showed us about the Dallas Mavericks. They came in and took that game. They did what they needed to go and get a win. And then the point where the Mavericks were up by 48, that tells us about the Boston Celtics. They eventually got to a point where they said, you know what, we don't really need that game. Sam Hauser even today said, hey, if we don't win game five, we're still up 3-2, so it's going to be okay. And so they obviously had that mentality at a certain point during the game. But I think the Mavs did well to go in there and actually take that one. Jonah? Yeah, I would tend to agree. I, I feel like it was a lot more of a Mavericks showing something that we hadn't seen all playoff series long. I mean, listen, it, we hadn't seen them play like a team since the previous playoff series. That was the first time we saw role players outside of Kyrie and Luka and Derek Lively step up in the way that they did. Tim Hardaway Jr. hitting five three-pointers in the fourth quarter. I mean, that kind of said it all, right? If he's if that's happening, you know it's a good night for the Mavericks. So I, I, I think it says more about the Mavericks in terms of them coming out and wanting to make a statement and not get swept by Celtics and um, Sam Hauser, that is, that type of statement, that is dangerous territory, my friend. You do not want to be saying those words because once that that seed of doubt gets planted, it can grow pretty fast. What about you, Andrew? Yeah, I, I'll I'll jump in here and say I do believe it was a little bit more on the Mavs. We I'll, I'll reference Greg Popovich in this. I know Mavs fans love hearing that, but he would continually continuously say, especially in this modern NBA, it's a make or miss league. Well, the Mavs finally started hitting their shots. It boiled down to the three started dropping in, and they, they played with pace and aggression, which we saw spurts in game three. But this time it felt like the entire game. And I, I've, I've commented on this a little bit in and around the, the newsroom here, but these games boil down to who is going to be aggressive and attack the rim the entire game through. The moment you start settling for jump shots, if it, you go cold, these runs can go crazy. So all of this boils down to if the Mavs hit their threes, they can get right back in this thing because they, that's how they're going to be able to keep pace with them moving forward. Joe, what did you, what did you think? I, I thought it was more about the Mavs and, and, and even, you know, more to the point, I thought it was about Luka Doncic, right? Because, you know, you, you could couch it however you want, but um, I won't say he embarrassed himself in game three, but he got darn close. 
Um, and listen, we're, we're talking about an all NBA player. We're talking about a generational talent. We're talking about a guy whose trajectory is for the hall of fame. And he didn't want that NBA final stain on him. And he made that abundantly clear because, oh, by the way, I saw him shuffling his feet and playing really good defense on Jason Tatum. And I, the blow buys that we have seen so frequently in this, um, in this series were not there. I also saw him actually pushing the pace after, by the way, Dante Exum got the pace going big time. I guess Luka thought, well, if Dante could do it, maybe I can do it too. And it resulted <laughs> once in a layup and, and another time in an easy alley-oop jam to Daniel Gafford. So I thought, thought it was about Luka responding as ferociously as I thought he would. And then that led the rest of the Mavericks team to saying, all right, yeah, we, we can do this. And I just want to see this Mavericks team put pressure on the Celtics because, to be honest, at 3-1, I think Hauser might be right. There's not pressure now, but my next question for the panel, and this time, Jonah, let's start with you. How much pressure would there be if the Mavs win game five? Tons, of course. I mean, at that point, the whole momentum tide shifts. It, it kind of already has shifted, hasn't it? Um, I realize it's nah. just one. I realize it's just one game, and we love to be prisoner of the moment. That's just what we do. We overreact to one game. After game three, we thought the sky was falling. It probably still is, but um, I, I think the seed of doubt has been planted. Absolutely, and if the Mavericks can find what they found in game four in Boston, who's to say they? that we're not talking about a game six in Dallas a few nights from now. There's no pressure on the, on the Celtics. They're not feeling that pressure right now. Think about what Sam Hauser said today. He said, even if we lose game five, we're okay. We're up. They're admitting that they don't feel the pressure right now. I mean, I think that they're them coming out and saying that that was pretty wild. I talked about that comment for a while on locked on Mavs tonight. And I think that, there, there's not a ton of pressure on the Celtics. And even if they win, even if they lose game five, go to a game six, they at least have two more chances to still close this thing out. So let's hope that the Mavericks take advantage of that idea that the Celtics don't have any pressure because they need to, to snatch another game. And if they can win two in a row, then all of a sudden maybe it shifts a little bit, Andrew. I, I'm going to follow up and compare it to something Kyrie said in the last series heading into game four where he was basically saying it's another game for us. It's the season for the Timberwolves and the Mavs lost that series. Uh, sorry, lost that game, excuse me. But I think that that's play, to, something to play with the mentality here. Like, the closeout game is important. It is supposed to be the hardest game to get. And if you're approaching these games a little bit more lackadaisically because you have time, it's going to be harder and harder to flip that switch and get back into the ultimate aggressive mode. And I think you saw the end result of that in arguably one of the most embarrassing losses from a potential would-be champion that we've seen in some recent memory. Joe, what would you think? Yeah, I don't think there's any pressure on the Celtics yet. And I will go back, just like you did, Andrew, I'll go back to the last series because the Timberwolves, after they won game four, after losing the first three, they said, we figured out, we figured out the Mavericks. And, well, that's the same thing that Derek Lively said about the Celtics. Let's hope that doesn't end the same way. But I do think if the Mavericks can win one here in TD Garden with this crazy Boston crowd, especially if they can play defensively as well as they did in game four, this thing will get really interesting. And I just want it to happen because I can't wait to see, you know, the pressure exerted on that Boston team to see how they will handle it. All right, great. You guys, we're off to a rousing start here. we got plenty more to talk about. We're live in Boston getting you set for game five of the NBA Finals on the ultimate Dallas Sports Show. Keep it here, folks. Plenty more to talk about next. Today's headlines, sponsored by your North Texas Chevy dealers. SMU grad Bryson DeChambeau survives to win the U.S. Open at Pinehurst by a single stroke at six under. Rory McIlroy blew an opportunity to force a playoff by missing a putt on 18. He finished second a stroke back. The Rangers get swept out of Seattle with a no-show on Sunday and a 5-0 loss. And happy Father's Day to all the dads out there, including my own, Frank Seeley. Hope you're still awake, Dad. We appreciate all you and the rest of the dads do.
All right, thanks so much. And listen, I'm not going to go anywhere other than saying happy Father's Day to Andrew's dad. Your son is absolutely <laughs> killing it here on WFAA. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, let's get back to the Mavericks as we count down to Game 5, which, as you all know, you can watch it right here on WFAA tomorrow at 7.30. Before that, make sure you check out the pregame at 6.30. It's all you need to get ready for tip-off. I'll have the Hall of Famer, Nancy Lieberman, joining me. All right, let's talk now, guys, about Jason Kidd. I want to get your thoughts about the way he handled going into game four and when he said, hey, give my man a break, talking about all the heat that Luka Doncic received after game three. Andrew, what'd you think? Uh, I, I thought it was it was perfectly stated for a guy that's been in the spotlight just like that and been fairly controversial even as a player in certain circumstances to just know when to tamper things down. And I, I'll, I'll come back a little bit to, to this in a second because I also want to point out Jason Tatum was just as demonstrative and quite frankly annoying with officials as Luca was in game three in game four. And there was no dialogue about that. And part of this really belongs to the conversation that Luca has a prior history with this. And that's why people decided to harp on him in this. Um, Kid, though, I felt like was just the right kind of settle down. There's no reason to let this vortex sweep us out of the entire playoffs and then contention entirely. And it's just another example of what I feel like he's been in a calming influence this entire time. It's similar to Bruce Bochy in a way. His influence has been very even keeled and level headed this entire way through. Jonah, what do you think? Yeah, I, I found Jason Kidd's response after game three to be incredibly measured. And he stays the same throughout the highs and the lows. And I feel like that's really what you need because there are so many emotional fluctuations, especially with a team that most of these players hadn't been to this point before. I mean, Kidd had gone to two finals, one finally with the Mavericks. He's been through this. And so he's speaking from experience. A lot of what he says is not just coach speak. It's because he's gone through it. And I think that carries a whole bunch of weight when he talks to the team and when he talks to reporters. And same goes for Kyrie Irving. He had Lucas back. He had kids back. And that when they move, they move as one. And Kyrie mentioned this after game three as well, or actually after game four, and how they're trying not to let outside noise affect them. And it had effect had affected other teams they've been on. So for them to kind of move as one cohesive unit and team, I think says a lot about the culture that they've built there. Nick, what do you, you agree, disagree or no? Yeah, I think that what Kid was saying about, you know, the, the criticism about Luka Doncic, I think a lot of it was, was great to come out and defend your guy, to be the coach, to, to do that. I think what happens is a lot of times we move the goalposts for Luka Doncic. Andrew said it earlier. Jason Tatum complains to the refs, has not shot well this series. His team's still winning anyway. It looks like the better team. There's not the same kind of uh, attention. There's the same kind of like expectations on Jason Tatum or a player like that there is on a Luka Doncic. The goalposts keep moving. Well, if he keeps acting this way, he'll never, he'll never win. They're in the NBA Finals. Like They've won at least a decent amount of this point the part that i didn't agree with jason kidd was the part that joe mentioned earlier when he said give the guy a break that's not what we do that has not happened ever for any athlete that's ever existed at this level of where they are dirk was called soft forever during his career michael jordan was 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 talked about with all his things lebron has been the most criticized athlete we've ever seen i mean even caitlin clark at this point i mean just any athlete that comes in they're going to get killed for some of their weaknesses lucas just happened to be big demonstrative like we said and on the biggest stage right now joe no i agree and listen luca is one of those big time performers and he is a lightning rod because of the way he goes about what he does and there's no doubt let me make sure i'm perfectly clear here he does need to continue to mature because he needs to unlock the greatest luca he can be in order for this team to try and win a championship so you're right i do think we should hold him to that standard because i think it will in the long run be healthy for luca because he needs to keep hearing it from different places at some point it's got to soak in because he can't be the best that he can be and we've seen it twice in this series when he stopped complaining in the Oklahoma City series look at how much better the Mavericks played small sample but it's begun to happen in game four of this series so I think that's going to be one of those things we will follow for the rest of his career because oh by the way he's only been doing it his entire life our Jason Wheeler went to Slovenia and his coaches even in his youth days says he, he used to perform the exact same way when he was a kid all right so that was the Luka Doncic segment 
And that was a long segment, you guys, but I think we had some great stuff there. We got to call another timeout, but there's plenty more to talk about as we get you ready for Game 5 of the NBA Finals right here on the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. And now it's time for the Top 5, sponsored by the Fort Worth Convention and Visitors Bureau. Welcome back to the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. Time now for a top five. This week we're counting on the top five father moments slash imagery in sports. Obviously it's Father's Day, so we wanted to celebrate those moments that make fatherhood a little more special. And let's kick things off with number five on our list, Team Hoyt. For those that haven't heard the story, Rick Hoyt was diagnosed as a spastic quadriplegic with cerebral palsy at birth, but his parents didn't give up on their son's future. His dad, Dick, competed in endurance events, including 72 marathons, six Ironman, Ironman triathlons, and 32 Boston marathons between 1980 and 2014. A remarkable story of perseverance and just the love between a father and son. His dad obviously pushing slash carrying him the entire way. Joe, your thoughts? Fantastic stuff. I first came across this story on Real Sports with Brian Gumbel and the love that that guy has for his son and wanting to keep, in, uh, wanting to keep him engaged and involved is absolutely fantastic. R great way to start the list, Andrew. Well, thank you. Finally, compliments on the top five. This is what I'm here for. All right, uh, <laughs> number four, Richard Williams welcomes the world to the Williams Show in 1999 at the Lipton Championships as Serena faces Venus, marking the first time ever two sisters faced off for a tennis title. They then contested, obviously, four straight major titles from 2002 to 2003. I felt like I had to get the father Williams involved in this. Nick, what, what were your thoughts on the Williams, the Williams sisters and their impact? Yeah, I mean, they've been incredibly impactful on tennis. I don't know how the, the guy that pushed his son through all those marathons isn't higher up on the list. I mean, that, he's like carrying his kid through all this. Like, that is an amazing father moment. Uh, we also won't, don't have to watch the movie that's on the Williams sisters and talk about this list. We'll just leave it at where it is. All right, that's fair. That's fair. All right, moving on quickly here to make sure we get through all this. Number three, it's hard enough to hit a baseball. How about hitting a home run in back-to-back at-bats with your dad? September 14, 1990, Ken Griffey Jr. and Sr. became the first father-son duo to accomplish the feat against the California Angels. Baseball is already renowned as a great father-son sport. This obviously is a special moment, even in that echelon. Jonah, your thoughts? Andrew, you're just hitting me right in the millennial feels. Anything Ken Griffey Jr. related, you are just... You are shredding the 90s core of me. Um, I mean, yeah, of course. You know, a lot of a lot of kids who grew up in the 90s, they love Ken Griffey Jr. They didn't really actually know a whole lot about Ken Griffey. It wasn't until they had to go back and read about it and look into some of the archive video. Um, amazing moment. They need to bring back the, the baseball video game of Ken Griffey. That thing was a banger. No, I, I'm with you on that one. All right, number two. One of the most iconic images in golf history, Tiger Woods hugging his father after winning his first Masters in 1997. This may or may not have been lower on the list had it not been for the fact that he got the perfect sequel in 2019 when Woods hugged his own kid at Augusta as a dad. Joe, your thoughts? Yeah, it's the circle of life, man. It doesn't get much better than that. We know um, how Earl prepared his son, the things he did, Earl's military background, the way he would treat Tiger, um, as difficult as he made things on his son, knowing that it would make him better. And believe you me, the most important club in Tiger Woods' bag was the 15th club. It was his mind, and that was cultivated by his father. And the fact that Tiger had a chance to hug Charlie after he came back and won when many thought he couldn't. Uh, circle of life moment, man. That is hard to beat. Incredible stuff. And finally, at number one, and this is – for me, I think, an, uh, maybe not an obvious one, but tops above all. 92 Barcelona Olympics, Jim Redmond carrying his son Derek across the finish line. Derek was competing in the 400-meter semifinal when his hamstring blew out and he collapsed on the track. His dad then helped him up and they finished the race together. It is, to me, the quintessential moment of fatherhood. They are not just for the victories and the celebration, but for the bad times as well to support us when we need it most. Nick, your thoughts? Yeah, this is just an incredible father-son moment. And I'm not a father myself, but I know that if I ever had a moment like that where I fall, I know my dad would be there for me. And I know that he would, would carry me to the end. And I, it's amazing that you start the list and end the list with, with fathers just carrying their sons through some of the hardest moments of their lives. Uh, Jonah, I'll open this up for the rest of you guys with this. Not even necessarily sports fatherhood moments, but the moments for you personally that you've had a connection with your dad in sport. 
Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so the shirt I'm wearing, I'm going to try to hold it up so you can see it. You see that it says Newton Soccer. Yeah, we got. I'm very you. bad at. I'm very bad at fr framing. There we go. You can see it. Newton Soccer. This is from the year 2000. This was the shirt that my dad wore when he coached our soccer team. Uh, as I grew up, about 15 minutes from where Joe is right now. Um, it, incredibly influential. I wouldn't be the person or you know, the sportscast or the sports fan I am without him. So um, yeah, everything, everything. Nick, your thoughts. Nick, Joe, what about you? Yeah, uh, I'll do maybe a negative one for my dad. The first time I ever beat him in one-on-one -on -one playing basketball, just an, an amazing moment. Uh, I'm six foot three. My dad's about five nine, and so I grew a little bigger than my dad. By the time I was fourteen, I could beat him one-on-one, -on -one, and it was just a, a moment that we shared as father and son. It's one that you know in your life you'll never forget. I definitely have not experienced that, Joe. Your thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, no, I was very fortunate, man, because I grew up around a baseball field, thanks to my dad. Uh, he was the coach at our little Catholic grade school in Houston, Texas, and I can still remember being five years old, and the first thing I learned was how to line that field and get the chalk straight all the way from home plate all the way to the to the foul poles, and it, it was fantastic. And the education that I learned being around him, he taught me math through sports. I was figuring out batting averages when I was five and six years old, trying to do it before the graphics would pop up on the TV screen. Um, it was just a fantastic foundation uh, for him as a father. So just great stuff. And, and kudos to you, Andrew Seeley. Way to produce this thing out. Way to get a good top five list this week. This wasn't one of those goofy ones like you normally do. So congratulations. Is that a good enough backhanded comment for, uh, compliment for you? Yeah, sure. I suppose so, Mr. Father of the Sports Department. I suppose I'll take that one. <laughs> You're doing great. There is summer. no swimming in this top five. All right, that's all right. We'll that, that's, that's much later. We got the entire summer for that. All right, stay with us. Joe's final take is coming up after the break. Welcome back to the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. Time now for Joe's final take. Tonight's final take has to do with the Dallas Mavericks, and it's something that rookie Derek Lively II said after the game for uh, victory. He said, we're not comfortable, and the Mavericks need to stay that way. Because if they do get comfortable, they will lose game five. What they need to continue to do is have that empty your tank mentality that we saw in game four. The defense that scrambled everywhere quickly. The push it up mentality on offense. Get the pace up. Keep going. We know it will be absolutely chaotic in TD Garden tomorrow. But to combat that, the Mavericks have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of it. Play with pace. Play with aggression. Play like you got nothing to lose because, quite frankly, they don't. All the pressure's on the Celtics at this point. Yeah, that's part of it, right? And they can exert more pressure on the Celtics if they can get another win. Make sure you watch us tomorrow. We'll be on live at 4, 5, 6. At 6.30, we'll have the pregame. 7 o'clock, ABC takes over. Then at 7.30, it is Game 5 of the NBA Finals right here on WFAA, your home for the Finals. All right, that'll do it for the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show. Thanks so much for joining us along with the ride. We will so see you tomorrow from Boston for Game 5. Good night, everyone. This has been the Ultimate Dallas Sports Show, sponsored by your North Texas Chevy dealers. Together, let's drive.